The following discussion contains summaries of information given in the following books. The Reshaping of Everyday Life by Jack Larkin. This is the next book that everyone should read. Home Life in Colonial Days by Alice Morris Earle, which is available from Project Gutenberg. Everyday Life in Early America by David Freeman Hawk. Colonial Craftsmen and the Beginnings of American Industry by Edwin Tunis. Our Own Snug Fireside, Images of the New England Home by Jane C. Nylander. And The Frugal Housewife by Lydia Child. Today's U.S. reader will find that the ways of their recent ancestors are different from their own ways in most every detail. Though this time occurred just 200 years ago, for today's big city dweller, the past is a culture that is more foreign than any city existing today on the other side of the planet. Throughout the first 150 years of Europeans living in New England before the Industrial Revolution, we lived in homes that had one or two rooms. Our homes were unpainted and did not have curtains, wall pictures, or carpeting. Our first homes had dirt floors. Windows were not filled with glass because glass was very expensive. The window space might be filled with translucent paper. A wooden window might be hinged with straps made of leather, not metal. Alice Earle explains that it was emphatically an age of wood, not metal. If a family had glass windows but decided to move, then they removed the glass and took them with them because of their value, even though they were not as clear as is today's glass. 
Nails were too expensive to use. This fence has wooden pegs rather than nails. Nails were expensive to make one by one by a blacksmith who cut long strips of metal into nail sized lengths and then flatten one end and sharpen the other. Yeah, we've provided the, the carpenter building the coffee house at this point it was somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty or twenty five thousand. The rafters and walls of this house have no nails. If a family used nails in building their home and later decided to move, they would burn down the house and retrieve the nails from the ashes. To encourage movers to instead leave the house intact for another person, the governor began giving a box of nails to the departers. The blacksmith shop hung this sort of picture sign outside the shop because many customers were illiterate. Each type of shop had a relevant picture sign. This is the sign outside an apothecary shop. And here is the saddle maker's shop. Outside the home, a stump was used as a chair and a log served as a bench. When making the bench, legs of green wood were placed snugly into those four top holes. As those legs dried and expanded, the fit became tight enough to support the weight of a person. At heights just a few yards or meters above the ground, wind always moves a bit faster and hence has a lower pressure than it does at the ground. The fireplace is built tall so that its top is placed in that faster moving, lower pressure air. This encourages smoke to rise up the chimney and out of the house. We clean the chimney with a broom and by dropping a couple of wing flapping chickens down into it. Not all of us could afford to build a home with a chimney. Smoke would stain the walls on its way out of openings at the tops of two opposite walls. Homes typically contained about 20 items. We had a few pots and ladles. We sat at the dining table on benches. We had a few wooden earthenware or perhaps pewter plates. Each person did not have their own plate. Instead, pairs of persons shared a plate and everyone may have shared a single drinking vessel. Continuing the medieval etiquette, each person was expected to wipe their mouth with a tablecloth before drinking out of the shared vessel. This trencher is a block of wood with a bowl-shaped indentation that was used for everyday meals. Two persons would share this trencher. We often use sharp sticks as forks and clamshells as spoons. We had a few baskets. This basket is used to trap and catch fish that swim into it while heading downstream. We may have had one prized mirror, even if it didn't work so well. We ground grain by pounding it in a hollowed log just as did the Wapanoag. Since the pounding could be heard for hundreds of yards or meters, one person announced a birth by pounding a certain beat. 
Here is a smaller version. A small pestle is on the storage cabinet. Additional items are stored in bags, just as did the Wampanoag. The Wampanoag also taught us to tap trees and make maple syrup. We followed the Wampanoag technique of burning to create the small canoe-like log that catches the sap. We had a wooden chair or two having no upholstery. Some chairs had reed seats. A three-legged chair sets well on unlevel ground inside the home and when milking cows. When a chair is not being used, it might be hung on the wall to keep it out of way. We had a candle holder made of tin and some homemade candles. This one is made from beeswax. Indoor bathrooms did not exist in New England. Emptying and cleaning the chamber pot was a daily chore. Chamber pots were used to avoid a freezing nighttime walk to the woods. By the year 1820, factory pots made in England were cheap enough that all but the poorest homes had one. The contents of a pot were often thrown through an open window or door. Since the throwers sometimes lost their grip, archaeologists often find broken chamber pots right outside the door. Some pots were inscribed. Some city homes had an outdoor pit for garbage and waste, but many persons simply threw the contents of their chamber pot into the street. There was a common story about a couple being hit on their way to a wedding. The bed is surrounded by drapes for warmth and privacy. During the winter, this bed warmer is filled with coals from the fireplace and then rapidly slid around between the covers to warm them so that people could crawl into a warm bed. The wooden enclosure kept this bed especially warm during winter nights. Three siblings could fit in this bed. During the summertime, children may have kept cooler by sleeping in the loft. The mattress is stuffed with chicken feathers and aired outdoors during the day. When the feathers start to smell, take them out, soak them in a tub of soapy water, and then put them back. <laughs> and you can also stuff a bed with rags if you had to. Yeah, that's what my son's bed is stuffed with, just because you need to be able to take him out and wash it. He's only three. Oh. <laughs> In many homes, the entire family might sleep in a single bed at night and then sit on the bed during the day because it is their only chair. Bedrooms are rare. If two beds are available, then all of the females of the family sleep in one of the beds, along with any female hired help and any female guests that might spend the night. Similarly, all the males sleep together in the other bed. This meant that we became used to being surrounded by the warm bodies of our siblings and came to miss that after our siblings had moved out. Combining warmth this way helped us make it through the cold winter nights with temperatures below freezing. For the same reason, travelers would share a bed with strangers who happened to be staying at the same tavern. Since wintertime temperatures were below freezing, everyone was sharing a bed a courting couple could share a bed, but only with a so-called bundling board placed between them, as seen in this 18th century example. The bed was held together with ropes that had to be tightened periodically. 
This device is used to tighten the ropes. It was said, sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. During the day at home, a bed frame might be leaned against the wall to get it out of the way. Only the wealthiest homes had a separate bedroom for the parents, but then this room could not receive any heat from the fireplace. We learned the hard way that cotton curtains are more flammable than our wool curtains. We use bed curtains to keep the warm thin and the cold out, so they were worth their expense, even at a time when only one in three homes had either one chair or one bench, and only one in seven homes owned both. People used a basin to wash themselves with water. Soap was reserved to wash only clothes. It was common to see mothers picking lice from the heads of their children. As our homes need repair, we make imaginative use of available materials because factory-made replacement parts do not exist. The cracks in home walls are filled with mud. Doors that won't shut might simply be allowed to hang sideways from one corner. Since glass is rare and expensive, we repair broken windows by stuffing them with rags, hats, or bags. The walls of a house are usually bare because paintings are too expensive. Only 10% of families can afford a single painting or engraving. These usually depict the homeowner. Since decorations are too expensive, our homes have very few of them. There are no clocks in the home before the Industrial Revolution. In many towns, not even one person owns a pocket watch. The house contained no insulation at all, so the summer heat and winter cold could only be endured. Winter snow blew indoors through cracks and formed little piles. Summer heat might melt indoor candles. Each house had a fireplace that was used for cooking, and it also provided light and was the only source of heat in the winter. But you might stand with the burning hot fire at your back while holding a frozen dish rag in your hands. Water would freeze in a bowl placed a few steps away from the fireplace. An axe is used most every day by the farmer to chop firewood. Different wood are used to produce a steady cooking heat or a lower heat for cooking certain dishes. The fireplace burns such a mountain of wood as this each year. The fireplace was constantly burning and making the sound of crackling logs. If the fire went out, a dish full of live coals might be fetched from the nearest neighbor, or a spark would be struck from flint into easily ignitable material, such as that of a dried maple tree. A slow burning fire could be lit deep within a hollow elm tree, where it could get little air, burn for weeks, and supply coals to relight the home's fireplace. Within the fireplace, a smaller fire whose heat was less intense is pulled off to a side to warm certain foods. Different heats were used for different purposes, just as is done today. We also cook our meals by placing heavy metal pots directly into the hot coals or by hanging pots above the fire. Smaller cooking pots have legs so that we can place the pot directly into a small fire. We also control cooking temperature by placing pots near or far from the fire. I'm just stripping some margarine right now, but there's a tansy in the bowl. And so it's, I'll be frying it pretty soon. It's uh, with spinach and cream.
We raise chickens for eggs and we grow food in gardens. In the new colonies, each home has a separate garden area rather than harvesting from some rows of a communally worked village plot as was done in medieval Europe. Oxen have not yet been transported from Europe to be used for plowing. We grow vegetables including cabbage, carrots, peas, pumpkins, parsnip, turnips, onions, garlic, asparagus, and we grow apples. Europeans had been using the word corn to mean cereal grain in general, and now the word becomes the name for maize, which had been grown in the New World for several thousand years before the arrival of the Europeans. Tomatoes and potatoes are also New World crops. We colonists plant corn exactly as taught by the Wampanoag. Corn is planted when winter oak leaves are the size of a mouse's ear. Every few paces, we push several kernels into the ground, pile dirt, and then fertilize with a herring. Fish had been used as fertilizer in parts of Europe. To keep a dog from digging up the fish, we tie one of its front paws to its neck. When stalks are knee high, we plant pumpkins and beans around them. The beans then climb the corn stalks. We harvest, grind, and preserve the corn and cook it using Wampanoag recipes, which we call pone, hemming, johnny cake, samp, and something that later becomes succotash. We have goats and cattle for milk and cheese, but we have to keep the goats from eating our gardens. Cattle are an old world domesticate. Someone soon finds that they thrive on corn. We have sheep for wool and we have pigs for meat. We slaughter and salt four pigs to feed a family through the winter. By the way, recall that in Mesopotamia, Inanna was the goddess of the storage house and its last piece of green decayed meat. We use every part of the pig except for its squeal. For example, its intestines become sausage skins, its bladder is a carrying bag, and the hair from its tail is used to sew bug skin. Gallbladder fluid from various animals is found to restore the color in clothing. We eat deer and raccoon and such but few of the newly arriving colonists know anything about hunting with guns because back in Europe only nobles were allowed to own them and this is a clue to the original meaning of the gun ownership clause in the US Bill of Rights. We are soon able to eat meat every day and this increases our average height by an inch or two over that of contemporary Europeans who rarely eat meat. New England is also thick with blueberries and raspberries. Initially, several transplanted European families would live together in a town, but land was so abundant that the very next generation would move outward. The expectation of abundant farmland was often the reason for transplanting the family from Europe to New England in the first place. Hawk points out that the transplanted persons had no plans of changing their culture as they moved to the new world. Each group set up life in their new home to match that of their old European culture. But notice that the culture of their children was no longer European. It was European American. Since the eastern side of the continent is covered by essentially one large forest, the space for each home is obtained by cutting away the forest trees, one by one, with an axe. As the clearing is being finished in one field, the clearing of the next field has already been started by cutting away bark to kill its trees. Since these so-called girdled trees will no longer grow leaves, crops can be planted around them and still receive sunlight. But in time, these rotting trees fall over and damage homes or other objects, 
so the experienced settler chose instead to clear land by cutting down and burning trees, but the stump still remained for a decade. Many travelers commented that Americans would not let a tree stand anywhere. European immigrants continued to build homes in the fashion of their old country. A house builder is called a house right. Sometimes brick is used, but mostly homes are constructed with heavy wooden posts and beams held together by nailless, mortise and tendon joints in which each board fits within a slot of the next board. House rights usually build a home from trees cut down right in the yard of the owner. It is usually too difficult and expensive to haul ready-to-use lumber from a sawmill. A broad axe is used to square a tree that has been marked with a guideline of red ochre dust applied by a stretch string. Then the adze is used to flatten the previous cut. A five meter long oak could be squared in this way in just two hours. Any wall that was assembled but still lying on the ground would be raised into place with the aid of the neighbors. Thatching reed is gathered for roofing material. A seacoast town might set aside a marshy area to be used only for gathering thatching reeds. We bundle them and form a roof that is easily repaired but also easily ignited. On the inside of the home, logs are smoothed by a person called a joiner who uses an adze and planes. Every cutting tool is made by a blacksmith who forges pieces of iron and steel brought from Europe or India. India produces the best steel and it is needed for every cutting edge. Since there were no closets, the joiner might make a lidded box to hold clothing and such. Later, some drawers were built under the box. And yet later, the box was all drawers. Only the largest homes had two floors, and in this case, it was the joiner who made the stairways and their balusters. The door has a wooden latch with a string that passes through a hole to the outside so that the latch can be raised. At night, the string is pulled inside so that the latch cannot be raised from the outside. Knowledge of the more easily built log home was brought to the colonies later by Swedes and became the typical home of the western frontier family. We have all heard that Abe Lincoln was born in a log cabin that he built with his own hands. We sweep the dirt floors of our homes with a sturdy birch twig broom that is made in the manner taught to us by the Wampanoag. It takes a person three evenings by the fire to make this broom. We work long hours surrounded by family, friends, and neighbors. But notice that our happiness does not depend on the number of items in our home. Dressing silks, and velvets, and, and the like. And I think um, there is a fellow north of here, a man by the name of Thompson, but I'm not certain if he's a gentleman, is he? Master Thompson? I don't think he is. I think he no. works for a gentleman, um, and he's come over here and he lives north on an island. But he's named after himself, there's one. Thank you. No, it wouldn't really be perfect. more that it be, uh, well, stout and that sort of thing. Good day, madam. How do you do? Did you want to sit down? I'm fine, thank you. All right. Before the Industrial Revolution had begun, only the very most richest of us could afford to pay other persons to hand make utensils and decorations. The rest of us made many of our own basic utensils using any handy material. The family traded extra eggs or may have made butter, cheese, or cloth to trade for other items at a nearby market. It was a barter economy in the U.S. just 200 years ago. But we were eating more meat than we had been eating in Europe. 
We had grown an inch or two. We had farmland. An interdependent neighborhood and life was full of hope for the future. A new industrialized world was on the horizon. <laughs>